This is the Sustainable Goat Podcast. We look to nature for how we should interrelate to the world. All the answers are within nature if we take the time to listen. But what we have to find is a reasonable way how to handle plastic. You know, consumers expect more. They're expecting brands to be more sustainable. They're choosing sustainable brands. These are the stories and ideas from those that will define a generation. I'm your host, Steve Kassinem, and this is our planet in focus. You have this really awesome history and good, awesome position that you're in in life in terms of, you know, you're driving change in the world and you're doing it from more of a financial standpoint and involvement standpoint in the humanity side of things. You're doing it with businesses, with companies, but you know, how did you get to where you are now? What was kind of the moment for you where you realized what you would eventually pursue in life? I think that's one of the most important things that I found in sustainability and whether that's, you know, a CEO, a founder, or a person who's a participant, it's why does somebody do what they do and what kind of drives them as a human? So what kind of drives you day to day? So like, obviously, as an Orthodox Jew, like my faith is what drives me. And I always grew up with this story that is brought down in the Talmud where God took a- took Adam and he said to him, look, this is the world that I created for you. You only get one shot at having a one planet. Be careful because I'm giving you the ability to choose whether or not you're going to live a happy life or a miserable life. And that's going to depend on your actions and how you react with that planet. And be careful because that once a species goes extinct or a tree goes extinct or you destroy your environment, I'm not going to fix it for you because you made that choice, right? And that was something that I grew up as a kid with that story ingrained inside me and always had an impact on what I did. Like as a little kid, I used to like, my mom used to put out like mouse traps, and I never let her flush the mice down the toilet. You know, I used to always tell her, we need to take the mice outside. And I was a little kid and she tells me a story all the time. She's like, we used to like, you literally like, we used to save animals and we used to like do all kind of like things that like looking back, I was like, wow, it was like super intense. But it was because that I was already from a young age, just this environmentalist, but it was coming from my faith. Like that story always driving me to, you know, make the world a better place and to have that impact on the world where my actions are important, you know, and we used to adopt whales when we were kids and give charity to save the whales. And like, it was like the coolest thing for a little kid to get like a certificate that they adopted a whale, you know, and those kind of things have a major impact on us. And I have the same type of relationship with my kids. We're about, you know, sensible sustainability and preservation and being a conservationist is a religious thing for us, but it's not as a religion, it's rather a portion of what my faith is. So that is something that had a major impact on me. So as I got older and I kind of got into the world of education and rabbinics, and I saw that while there was a lot of people in my community who were involved in that space, there were not a lot of people in my community who were contributing to sustainability on the business side. Most of the investments and most of the businesses that they were investing in were the classic, you know, investment banking, commercial real estate those sectors, which are, you know, there's nothing wrong with them per se, but they're not making a difference in other people's lives. And I wanted to do something that was going to make an impact. And in the 20, in like the mid, you know, 2010s, like around 2016, 2017, that was when I kind of really started seeing the problems that, you know, it was becoming very, very apparent that we have this like crisis on this planet that we need to address. And it's not like we don't have the technology and it's not like we don't have the methodology to do it. It's that a lot of investment that is happening and a lot of innovation that is happening is going for like these kind of moonshot ideas that maybe will help change the situation. Maybe won't, but really we have a whole slew of technologies and a whole plethora of ideas that if we just adapted those and mainstream them, then we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We just have to, bring those and commercialize them and actually bring them into the fore. And and the only way to do that is through that kind of impact investing model and trying to do that. So that's kind of like where I started. That's when I conceptualized 
Synergos and like was like focused on like synergizing all of the things that I'm doing and started investing in that. So it was like a very long journey, but ultimately that was for me the moment where I kind of just opened up my eyes and saw like I could either take that track of being a Jewish educator and like contributing to my community in that kind of way and just be like everybody else, or I could like do something that I'm already passionate about anyway, which is deep tech, high science innovation and kind of use my faith and use that kind of that a parable and story that I told you about and use that as kind of a stepping stone to conceptualize my whole business model of what I want to accomplish and how I could use that to contribute to humanity. Right. And I think that that's like what it was all about for me at that moment. There's this moment that I think you have a almost put your chips in moment of like, I'm going to commit to doing this and this is going to be a step. What was that like? That is a you know fundamentally impactful decision to actually say, I'm going to commit to this. And there's, I guess, a certain level of sacrifice that comes with that of knowing that there are massive challenges ahead. There's an uphill battle. What was that like for you to navigate that personally? Because I think Impact investing is getting a little bit more popular. You have that side of like, hey, we need to invest in changes on this side. But, you know, specifically as a person, it's a bit of a risk. You didn't have as much of that background. What was that transition like? It was hard because that, you know, when you're so passionate about your ideas and you're like, I'm going all in, you think that the whole world is just going to come along with you, right? And then you start realizing that you're literally like, you're basically becoming a glorified fundraiser, right? And you're literally trying to convince people to part from their hard earned money to help support your idea, which you hope that they believe in and they tell you that they believe in and they publicly claim that they believe in. But then at the end of the day, you're not part of that ecosystem. You're not part of their like environment and they don't really know who you are and they don't really have their faith in you yet. And you're going to have to prove yourself. And that is something where you basically kind of like come to that, like as Sam Altman says, you have like that moment where you're going to have either perseverance or you're going to fold, right? And you're going to say, okay, listen, you know, I tried my best. I had a dream. It's not a good dream for me. And I'm going to move on because that I don't have that mental fort to move on. But I think that when you take that, that leap, you're taking, at least from my perspective, that kind of that leap of faith where you're, you know, expecting that sooner or later you're going to fall and you're going to hit that straw and you're going to survive, you know, like ever play Assassin's Creed, right? So like, would you like jump off the top of the building, you know, like into the straw. And that's kind of like what it feels because you don't know where you're going to, what you're going to, where, how long you're going to fall. You don't know how long it's going to take and you don't know what you're going to fall on to, right? You're hoping that you have a soft landing and you land on your feet. And for me on a personal level, it was a journey that required, that still requires a tremendous amount of mental, like a strong mental constitution to have that ability to keep the eye on the prize and to realize that things are going to go wrong. Things are going to be hard. There are going to be challenges, but nonetheless, you have to persevere. You have to push forward because what you're working on is so big and so important and so great. And if like, you know, if one day they put on your, like, what do you want them to say on your tombstone. Here lies Rabbi Echazkel Moskowitz who tried and failed, or here's Rabbi Echazkel Moskowitz who tried and tried and tried and tried and tried, you know? And, and I'd much rather be the guy who tried and tried and tried. And I think that the guys who try and try and try and don't stop, those are the guys, it doesn't matter what the end point is because they're living a life that is fulfillment because they're actually pursuing their dream, right? And you have to do that. You have to pursue your dream. You can't give up on your dream. Yeah, I also noticed that there's like almost this moment where you can't go back. Like once you take that leap, the world that was and the world that you were now pursuing, it almost is two totally different things that you can't even go back at all. It just, you have to keep pushing forward. Not even a question. I think that that's why there are so many folks, you know, like Hollywood is a good example, right? Why are there so many people there who are like, I had my mom had a cousin who was in Hollywood his entire life trying to become an actor because that was their passion. That was their dream. And the whole family laughed at them. But once you're in that ecosystem, you're in Hollywood, you have that dream that one day you're going to hit that star, right? 
you're just going to keep pushing it because that, you know, the small gig will lead to the next gig, the gig and the next gig. And before you know it, you make it. I mean, like if you look at Robert Downey Jr.'s life, he was an actor, you know, and then he had obviously a major downfall, became a nobody, was like in the dumps, but he never gave up on that dream. And he worked his way out of his struggle because he still saw himself one day becoming Iron Man. You know what I'm saying? And now he's probably the most recognizable actors in the world and will probably be that way for the next, you know, century, right? Like, that's just how it is. So you have to see yourself. Like, you have to you have to envision yourself. Like, you're going to succeed. You're going to be there. You're going to end up. And it's not, if you're doing it for the fame and for the fortune, which are all the wrong reasons, you're not going to succeed because that you're not going to be able to fully focus because you're going to see others who are accomplishing while you're not. If your vision is about, I want to see myself as the guy who did X, Y, and Z because of that way X, Y, and Z happened, then you're going to get there, right? And like, I've studied a lot like actors' lives. The best actors are the ones who are like these method actors because that for them, acting is not about the money. It's about being able to explore those new opportunities to be new characters, to kind of like, you know, discover themselves from a new vantage point. And as an entrepreneur, I think that's really what it's about, exploring what you're capable of doing, right? And I'm assume, assuming that's like for you as an artist, right? You always want to improve. You like make a video for a client. You're like, okay, like I did that. If I had that angle shot or that part of the narrative, it'd be so much better. So next client, we're going to make it like that, you know? And for the entrepreneur on the deep tech space, you have to have like a strong innovative stack orientation where like it's never enough. You're always going to improve it. You're always going to fix it. You're not just going to run with one product. You want to always grow the concept and build this massive ecosystem that is able to achieve all these different goals while it's vertically integrated and working together. And I think that that is something that is exciting and it drives you, you know? Well, and as you started to explore the world, what was that first, I don't know, avenue of curiosity that you explored? Because I mean, deep tech and a lot of these really complex problems that we're facing in the world, for some it's overwhelming, for others it's many opportunities. And focus is one of the hard things to achieve in that. It's like there's so many issues, you could go attack any of them. Why deep tech? And then more specifically, what was the focus out of the gate of why you decided to pursue it? That's a great question. So I think that like I started off like wanting to do something, but I had no idea what I wanted to do. Exactly like you said, there's just so many opportunities. So I happened to like be like in the right place at the right time. And a friend of my family's comes over to me with this investment opportunity into the first of its kind vertically integrated magnet plant. In other words, they have the round top project in Texas, and then they were going to do a environmentally benign rare earth concentrator in Wheat Ridge, Colorado. And then they were going to have a magnet plant in, and now they finalized the location in Stillwater, Colorado. Everything was going to be working in an environmentally benign way. And more importantly, there was going to be very little tailings from the mine because that they were actually going to do a co-extraction process where they were going to extract all of the materials inside the mine. And it had a bunch of other reasons why it made sense from a financial perspective. And the model made a lot of sense because it was really sustainable. That was a traditional mining opportunity, but it had that type of posture and it was gaining bipartisan support. So it was something that I felt like I would like to get involved in and learn that space because that's something that I saw that already President Obama in 2011, we had this quote unquote rare earth and critical mineral crisis where China basically has a monopoly over the rare earth space. And I was like, well, the United States needs to have its own sustainable path to do this. And, you know, while the mining practices in China and in other countries in the world, like, like Kazakhstan or Malaysia are done in a non-environmentally sustainable way, if we mine those materials here, we're going to do them in a way that is, has a much lower environmental impact than other countries, right? And that is something that is important because that we want to have the materials that we need in order to make technological advancements. I'm not like one of these anti-consumerism type of guys that believes that we should just go back to the Stone Age. There are those who argue that, and that's their prerogative. But at the same time, I believe we have to have progress, but we also have to do it in a sustainable way. So that was something that was attractive to me. 
And I got involved in the company and I was involved in the pre-seed round and I was involved in the seed round and was making, I made a couple investments and I was looking at it and I said to myself, you know, why are we going and mining all these materials from brand new assets when there's over 500,000 abandoned mine lands across the country? Over 40,000 of them are high risk that are causing acid mine drainage and which is causing damage to vegetation and life across the country. A lot of it is concentrated in the Appalachian basin from coal, etc. I was like, what is there and can we find that path? So I had the fortitude of meeting this guy who's like old school, comes from like that central Pennsylvania area. I met him. He used to work at the Department of Energy. Now we work together. And he was like, yeah, extracting all that material from all these abandoned mine lands would be a huge opportunity to do what we call mine remediation through polymetallic recovery, which is that you basically, you extract all the materials that are causing the acid mine drainage. You then go and resoil the soil with lime and other materials that help clean the material and bring it back to a good pH level. And then you then reforest it. So you actually end up creating brand new forests that are there while at the same time extracting all the materials at the same time. And we've developed this technique It's not really a patented process because anyone could do it. It's not like patentable, but it's just a cool way of doing it. The techniques of how we extract the materials are patented. And I started like bootstrapping that because I was like, instead of just focusing on one project, I could focus on it. But then I kind of learned the hard way that, you know, first of all, I didn't even try to really raise money from it because it's way over most people's heads. Like they're like, okay, like at least at the time. Now, rare earth and critical minerals are now more in people's consciousness. So it's becoming something that's more interesting to people. So my brother and I, we were bootstrapping that company and I was like, okay, so interesting because that like, while we're doing this, which is growing and we got federal grants and it was getting support and it was growing slowly, holistically, there's a lot of work that needs to be done in order to actually get this to a commercial state because that the geography and the geographic locations are comp- and the stratigraphic composition of the material is completely different from one place to the other. So just kind of figuring out the right technology that can kind of like find that common denominator and build up on a regional level takes a lot of time and it's a lot of work. But meanwhile, there's enough rare and critical minerals in these tailings that we would not have to do a new mine for a hundred years, you know, which is crazy, right? And that's a like, conservative estimate. So like you start seeing that and you're like, okay, like that's something that's worth pursuing. And you kind of have to be focused on that while I'm doing all of that. I said to myself like, oh, that's so interesting. You know, I need to really like, these are all going to support that energy transition, but we also need a base load power source. And then that's how I got into like the nuclear space and started incubating a nuclear company. And as I did that, I was like, okay, well, like we also have to feed the world. So like, how are we going to feed the world? So I got into like some ag tech. And all in all, just kind of like just everything comes like holistically to me because if it all fits within one ecosystem of how are we going to power the world? How are we going to build the world? How are we going to feed the world? Those kind of three basic tenets of society are something that there's so much room for innovation and for sustainable innovation. And I think that it's something that, as you said, it's going to take time for the investor world to kind of come to an understanding of it and finding that environment where you know you can marry the innovators with the folks who are investing where both sides could have their cake and eat it too that's really hard to find that equilibrium you know did you come from a science background because i think for most people when they think mining they just think oh drill down and that's it obviously there's so many levels of scientific research and geology that goes into all of it that most people don't look to understand never have the opportunity to understand did you have a science background or an interest in it, or did you just kind of fall into it and then just explore? So that's so funny. No, no. So I, so I, my entire life was in love with science. I grew up where I used to love going on the Sabbath, on the weekends to my grandparents' house, because my grandfather was a chemical engineer from Cooper Union, which in those days was a prestigious engineering school in New York City. My grandfather grew up in, in Brownsville, went to Cooper Union on a scholarship, got a chemical engineering job. But in those days during the Manhattan Project, it wasn't like today where there are all types of like worker comp oriented programs. So when he had a friend who was working at the National Lab here in New York, I forgot what it's called, 
in Stony, I think it's in Stony Brook, there's a national lab there and he's literally got, had a massive accident and didn't couldn't work anymore. And there was nothing to take care of him. My grandfather was like, I was working in, in working around that kind of space. He's like, forget it. This is not for me. I'm trying to raise a family, but I don't have the luxury. So he started working for the department of energy and he became a math teacher and ended up becoming a principal and ended up becoming a superintendent and ended up also working at NASA community college. So he ended up in education. So what I used to do is I used to go to on the weekends and he had the, this life series on science. Have you ever seen those? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. A I used to long time them. ago. Uh, yeah. These are old school and he still has them in perfect condition at his house. And I go there once in a while and I used to read them cover to cover. Like I just was a kid. I was just reading. I was just a bookworm and I just read and read and read and read and read and read so many hours. And the part, the book that I loved the most were two topics, energy and space. Those are the two books that I remember the best. I was not so interested in biology. I'm not so interested in life sciences, you know, like, okay, like, great. You know, we evolved from monkeys, like, okay, not really interesting to me, but like energy, power of the world. And, you know, as an adult, going back and looking at all these books that were written in the fifties and the sixties, right. You start to realize that like, holy cow, these people were so much more advanced than us in their aspiration for, for the impossible. You know, we've become so complacent with where we are. And I'll illustrate this for you, right? People don't realize this, but literally 20 years ago, people were flying from London to New York on a Concord in three hours. Okay. What happened? Why are we okay with the fact that it takes, it's a seven hour flight, right? Why are people okay with the fact that, you know, there's such a thing called a bullet train. And in Japan, for example, you can travel across Japan in a mere few hours if you get on to Amtrak and try to take trek from New York to Miami, it's going to take you a few days. I think it's like maybe longer than 24 hours. Don't quote me on that. But I think like if you do the stops and you don't take the direct, it's going to take you a long time. It will take over a day or two or three to get from New York to Los Angeles. We should have a bullet train that should take us from New York to Los Angeles in a couple hours, right? There's no reason why not. People don't know this. Walt Disney had a permit to build a nuclear reactor in Disney World. Really? You could Google it. Wow. They were going to build a nuclear reactor in Disney World. So there was a once a world where we dreamed. There used to be the World's Fair in Queens, right? Yes. And there was that we were inspired to do great things. And in those days, there was the Rockefellers and the Carnegies who built this crazy industry of train tracks. All of the infrastructure that exists today was built during that time, right? The Verrazano Bridge, that was built during that time with probably with Rockefeller steel, you know, or Carnegie steel. So what happened? And I think it's because we've lost that American spirit of, you know, dreaming the impossible that concept of American exceptionalism that we could do that we, we, anything they can do, we can do it better. And I think that the reason why that happened is because that just, we've become profit oriented where everything is about profits and about instant gratification where it's like, I want to maximize my profits in the quickest way possible. So therefore that, that idea of when Carnegie and Rockefeller built the, their companies, they built it with investors. They kept on issuing stocks. They kept on raising money. It's not like that they literally went and did a public offering and raised money and raised money and raised money. This is all historical fact. But they were able to get people to invest in them because they were able to leverage that money to just continuously build and never stop. And they built these massive empires. What drove them to build these massive empires? Some will argue it was profit. I would argue it was progress. They wanted to see the world different than what it was to and they instead of having going on a you know taking a train and then getting on a carriage to go to a train track a different area they wanted to create this massive infrastructure where you could be where you could connect the entire country and they wanted to build massive buildings and i'm saying the whole entire washington dc today when you go there it has this kind of 
Roman-esque kind of like architecture, which kind of, you know, can be translated in a negative way as an American imperialism, or it can be kind of, I guess you could say, kind of interpreted as a way of bringing progress to the world. Like what I'm saying, like when we think about Rome, Rome did bring a great era of prosperity to the entire Mediterranean. They uplifted all these communities. Did they oppress them as well? Yeah, they did. I mean, we're not going to sugarcoat it, right? We obviously, as democracy, freedom-living people, our job is, is not only to uplift our country, but to uplift our world and be able to bring the great American te- uh, promise from a technological and innovation perspective to the rest of the world. And we just don't want to do that anymore. We've become, I guess, and this is kind of like going into that dark realm of, you know, the military industrial complex and how it's become a lot about special interest groups. And there's a lot of that kind of stuff going on. And I don't know if you want to discuss it or not. I'm kind of magnanimous. I don't care. But to me, really, it's about how do we get inspired to do the impossible again? And we have, by the way, some innovators that are like that today, like Elon Musk's of the world, you know, SpaceX, he wants to do reusable rockets. You know, there's other folks like that, whether it's Mark Zuckerberg, what, what he built with hit with Meta and what uh, Jeff Bezos built with Amazon and with what Bill Gates built with Microsoft. But again, a lot of these companies are doing software and oriented things that have made our lives really fast and quick paced. But how many inventors and entrepreneurs can you point to? And maybe you know some that you could point to that are working on bridging us to the next step of our progress as a, as a species, right? And I don't think there are many because to do that takes a lot of work. It's very hard. Yeah, there's a concept that we've been talking about lately inside a goat, and it's this concept of like a patient urgency. And it's this idea of knowing that we have the ability to shift things in our planet, in our world, the way that we do things. But going back to the instant gratification side, it's not going to happen overnight. And expecting a switch to go off, it's not the way it works. But the patient progress of something is the more important part. And it's the willingness to be like, to ask the question, why not, rather than why. So instead of why do this, be like, well, why can't we do it? Why not try? Because in the failure, you also learn lessons. And in those lessons, you also learn how to do things a bit better. You make progress on the idea. You make progress on maybe that discovery, the idea that champagne was an accident. Like that concept is very much rooted in innovation. And I think that right now we're living through this time of probably the most interesting time, arguably, in history. We have a globally connected world. We have the ability to bring together incredible different cultures, mindsets, thoughts, people, solve problems. We have a material space that's exploding because there's, we're realizing we can do so many different things. And how do we take all of these ideas and put them towards something that has a positive impact on the planet? And that to me is that excitement, that innovation. I mean, that's what GOAT is all about is it's sharing the people who are willing to do things differently, who dream it differently and are doing it because we could accept the status quo or we actually have this ability that we can shift it. And that's where I find we're just in this really cool spot. Yeah. And it's, it's pretty incredible because there was this article in time in January, 2019, that was about how America risks losing its innovative edge. Right. And it basically was saying, how the United States economy was essentially propelled by a combination of three innovative things, right? The computer, the microchip, and the internet. And they were saying that the research and development that produced that was this triangular alliance, so to speak, of the government, academia, and private business, right? And that was something that helped us a lot in in World War II and then in the Cold War era that helped bring that entire world into visibility. And Silicon Valley is actually rooted in that entire story because Silicon Valley, the Silicon chips, right? But it's a double-edged sword because while we had so much progress on those three things, you know, the computer, the internet, and the microchip, that also kind of fried, created a very fast-paced world. 
that in a way took away the will to dream of so many people because making money became easy. You didn't have to work hard to build something anymore because you could literally build a tech startup where you could build an app and a lot of people are going to buy your app and now you're going to make a lot of money. You can, you know, use your tech, your computer model to not really know how the stock market works, but just build the right algorithm that figures it out for you. Now we have these crazy innovations in AI where AI is going to do all of that for us. But what is it going to do? AI is not going when it becomes sentient, which I don't know if it ever will, but if it does, AI is going to do what's good for AI. It's not going to do what's good for humanity. And therefore, humans still have to, to capture the moment and realize that we need to innovate as a species because there's going to be, and at least I see it this way, if AI does become sentient, I don't think it's going to go to war with humanity. I just think it's going to become its own thing. It's just not, it's going to coexist with us. It might look at us as like, oh, those are our masters and they are, you know, it might revere us the way, you know, we quote unquote revere God or we revere the aliens or the cosmos, whatever your faith is, right? And whatever, like what we believe is our creator, that's what we revere, right? So if you're an atheist, you revere evolution because that, that is in, a sense, in essence your creator. If you are a religious Jew, you revere God because God is your creator. So I believe that like holistically AI will revere us as its creator, but eventually it will move on. It will either become much more intelligent than we ever could unless we figure out ways to make ourselves more intelligent through my, like implants and chips like, and stuff like that that make us more sophisticated and un figure out how to unlock the power of our brain, which is more powerful than they ever could be on a data technical space. We just don't know how to really unlock it. But we will then force ourselves to evolve. And that's going to be a very interesting world to live in. But the question is, how are we going to evolve? What are the values that we're going to evolve with, right? And that is something that AI will never be able to do for us. It's going to have to come from within because that we have that heart, you know, that heart that drives us. It's not really, it's the heart that feels, it's the heart that wants, it's the heart that yearns, that desires, you know, and what do we desire? What do we want? Do we would desire to make videos on YouTube or on TikTok and become, go viral? Or do we yearn to build mega structures and conquer the stars, right? That is what we have to figure out a way to impart on the next generation. And I think the only way that will happen, and this is, by the way, kind of comes back to what you spoke about in the beginning. What drives me is that if I'm successful, then there'll be a hundred more entrepreneurs like me who will believe that they come from nothing and they can go and dream for big and build something big because there's going to be that opportunity. And I think that that exists in the entire venture space, but in deep tech, no one's going there. Yeah. Well, and I think a lot of this comes down to the individual desire. What does the individual want out of their own desire? You know, what's their goal as a person? And it's okay to dream with whatever you want to dream, but go after it with the same abandonment as the person who's going after the stars, who's going after doing the things that's never been done before. It doesn't have to be, you know, if you are not interested in science, I'm not particularly interested in science at the same level. I love to see the application of it. So I'm not interested in developing a rocket. However, it inspires me to think in the world that I live in, how can I push the boundaries? And I think that goes back to the idea of innovation, but it also goes to the idea of the next generation. And I think when you have this, I think the most progress that's ever been made in society is generally when it's squeezed. It's the idea of you have pressure and you feel not trapped, but more so that you have to ideate your own way out of your challenge. And I think that sometimes that is the best way we can actually move forward as a society. And so when you start thinking about, you know, what's this squeeze that we're facing now, and it's our planet, it's the ocean system that we're surrounded by, the forest system that we're surrounded by, but also the energy systems that support us, the food systems, the water, all of that. What is deep tech? Like realistically, what is deep tech for people that don't understand it? So deep tech in the classic sense is a startup that's business model is based on high tech innovation and engineering, and that will lead to significant scientific advances, right? 
So people like like when deep tech is like in vogue. So people are like, oh, let's call blockchain deep tech. But really, it's much more focused on like and I quantum computing, robotics, artificial intelligence. But again, artificial intelligence is now its own sector. So I don't like to really call it deep tech. And biotech is its own space, and blockchain is its own space. So I would really say, and quantum computing is frankly its own space. I would really say that deep tech today is in energy innovation, robotics and drone innovation, in photonic and electronic innovation, and advanced materials. And there's a lot of opportunities there, and obviously nanotechnology and those kind of things that are all kind of inter are interrelated, right? So like. For example, just like let's what what is deep tech? So let's say right now, and this is like we have to be realistic, right? So like right now the oceans are full of plastic, right? Let's say we really want those oceans clean, because that would be good for the ocean. But let's say we figure out a way that the United States does not create any more plastic, which is gonna be very hard, but frankly, as far as like plastic pollution, like in the ocean. And I'm just going to Google this quickly. The U.S., our percent, we are not the, the United States contributes just 0.2% of the world's ocean plastic, while despite making over 3% of the world population. So, like, we're doing pretty well for our population size. You know, if it would be 3% based off of our population, right, then you'd say, okay, we have a problem. But, like, we are doing really well. But now other countries, like in Asia, that don't have as well of a trash system, uh, management system as we do, they're producing a lot of plastic. So let's say we're going to go and develop a technology that basically will be a re- some sort of technology that we could incorporate into plastic, that pay- plastic, as soon as it makes contact with salt water, for example, it will biodegrade over a period of, of five years or two years or whatever it is, right? Now, we don't know what that technology is. There's a lot of research needs to be done there. We're going to need to go to a public university. We're going to need to find some professors who are like experts in like plastics and like the chemical composition of them and what would make them react in a certain way. And we're going to have to spend a couple hundred thousand, maybe a couple million to develop a baseline of a, of some sort of product. And then we then have to, you know, build it up and then we're going to have to commercialize. It's going to take 10 to 12 years, maybe 15 years to get that product to market. Another deep tech example is let's say right now, carbon fiber is manufactured in a different process that is very expensive and not efficient. So now carbon fiber, which is a better material for, which is a lot less, which technically is recyclable and is more consumer friendly and is actually much better for like, let's say for platforms like vehicles and other type of applications, both defense and commercial. Now coal is a material that you could create carbon fiber from and the technology already exists, but it's never been commercialized. It needs like another couple of, we would need about a hundred million to get this technology to market, right? An R and D plus a pilot to build it. So now that's a deep tech and investment. Now you take that technology, you bring it to market, you are able to then start producing it. Now what happens to coal though, when you actually start creating carbon fiber and carbon foam and all these materials from coal, coal's price goes from about $150 a metric ton, which is literally to burn it to about $3,000 a metric ton. So that upgrades coal and gives it a brand new utilization that it's no longer actually being burned. So therefore carbon emissions are not actually being produced by coal because coal is now a a manufacturing material. Another deep tech innovation would be in 3D manufacturing, which is something that there's a lot of work that's being done there. And actually at Oak Ridge National Lab is one of the locations where that's done. I know that some of the big companies like Boeing and others are starting to use it in aerospace. If we could figure out a way to manufacture things with robots and through 3D manufacturing on a large scale, not just like a little small little thing for your kitchen table, you know, like to build a ship with 3D manufacturing techniques. Now, they actually have been proven to be more solidly composed and they actually are more efficient materials, tested them. But now you don't need to build massive forges that require a ton of energy to build materials because the 3D printing robot is able to print the same exact component and put it all together in a much more sustainable and efficient way. But to get these technologies to market takes 
anywhere from 10 to 15, maybe even longer years. The funny thing is, is that just now there's a good illustration of this. A lot of successful startups like Uber or like Instacart that's going to now do its IPO, they did spend about the same amount of money to become profitable. And it took about the same amount of time to get to the IPO. In fact, Instacart from the day of conception, from their series, from their seed round till today, till their IPO now, it's going to be a little bit more than 12 years. And they have spent over $1.9 billion to get to this point. Okay. People don't realize that. So what's the difference between that and deep tech? It really ends up costing the same. It's about the same amount of time. So why aren't investors investing in that space a lot more when really the total addressable market of the deep tech is much greater than the Instacart because right. you'll make a lot more money. Whoever figures out how to, you know, mass manufacture ships is going to be making a lot more money than the guy who is doing Instacart, right? Because that revenue and profit is very different, right? Um, maybe Instacart will make more money on a revenue basis, but on the profit basis, I don't know where their margins are, right? Maybe I'm wrong, but that's how I see it at least. Is it necessarily like the... Like to me, it's the willingness to see risk. You know, I think when you think about, you know, 3D printing ships, well, it's risky. It could fail. Much as any startup could fail, but it almost seems, oh, well, if grocery delivery doesn't work, people can still go get groceries. But if we spend all this and we can't print ships, well, then what do we do? You know, is that part of the narrative of the hesitancy around putting money into deep tech? Like the uncertainty? That for sure, that is for sure. There's for sure that element. I think that if you ask me, the number one issue is that at least I encounter when trying to pitch this to investors, and maybe I'm just doing a terrible job at it. I think that it's a path to revenue because that Instacart from day one was able to start getting subscribers, and then they made a couple bucks on the transaction or a couple cents, right? And it became a macro game. And then obviously people don't know this, but like Instacart, I don't want to come across like I'm bashing them. On the contrary, I think they're, I hope that they're successful. I want everybody to be successful. But like people don't know this, that Instacart drivers or runners, so to speak, get paid under minimum wage. And it's not, I, I don't know, like if they ever unionize and then they want to get better wages, then Instacart, I don't know how they're going to make money unless they like just grow their market so much. Like there's obviously risk there, but from an investor perspective, as long as I can see the company making revenue, even if it's at a loss, Instacart only made a profit in 2022, right? That was like literally last year. Now they're finally making the profits. They're make, doing an IPO. I was not there. So I'm not part of the venture capital world. I was not like a seed investor in these companies. So I didn't watch these companies grow, but I am an investor in deep tech. And I could tell you that in deep tech to get to profitability is a very long time. And what I've been doing as an entrepreneur is I'm trying to figure out ways to kind of, I believe that if you scale the technology and you do it in a smart way, you probably can introduce profit and revenue generation into the, into the model earlier. But that's also very hard because then it, unless you can coalesce the academia, government and private industry to support you, right? Which is kind of like where I've been going, but like it's, it's not always, it's like, it's a, hard, a lot of work to convince the Hill that they should help, you know, subsidize you to become a customer for your products. Not yeah. every deep tech company is going to be able to say, Hey, uncle Sam, we have a whole bunch of rare and critical minerals to sell you for your F 35 jet, you know, for the Pentagon. So buy off of us, the material, even in small quantities, not every company is going to be like, Hey, uncle Sam, we're producing at our pilot scale of our nuclear waste recycling technology, a whole bunch of isotopes that you need for the Department of Energy, for the Department of Defense, for all types of applications, some of them even classified. So therefore, like here, you're my customer now. What about 3D printing? The federal government already has Newport News to build their aircraft carriers, you know, like, and they already have a whole system built. They're not going to, they might give you some DARPA money, you know, like here, here's a contract, let's test it out. And obviously if it goes, and then they're hoping that like private industry will come and step in, it happens sometimes that that's it doesn't happen. But when it does happen, it's because the private industry says, oh, wait, here's a company that has a crazy amount of potential for an IPO. We're going to get involved so we could IPO it and then we'll make a ton of money. They're not saying, oh, let's get involved because this company is going to change the way that we build ships forever. 
So yeah, is that the, I think what you're up against a lot of the time is like this, you're living in the future, essentially, like the 10, 15 year ahead, you're saying, this is what I see the world can be this way. And it's possible. And if we dream it big enough, and we go after it, like, it can be done. Is it just like this? I I guess what's the challenge in communicating that? I mean, because you're communicating, hey, this is where the world can be in 15 years. I mean, when I grew up in Silicon Valley, and I remember seeing the first Tesla Roadster parked in San Jose, just saying, hey, here's an electric vehicle built on a Lotus platform. And it has a battery as the thing that propels it down the road. And it was like, wow, that's kind of cool. And it was kind of like, well, maybe one day that'll be a thing. Fast forward 10, 15 years. And now it's a very normal conversation to say, let's put a battery in a vehicle and make an electric vehicle. And so what's that? How do you communicate something that is so far and above people's consciousness to where they get on board with it? I think that, and this is something that I've come to kind of understand recently. I think that it's it's not going to be conveyed to them through a pitch deck. It needs to be conveyed to them through media. And that's like why I thought that like what you guys are doing is really cool because that you're using media as a way to convey to them the vision for the future. Now, Elon Musk, when he came in as an investor for Tesla and essentially took over the company, he was not the actual inventor. And the inventor had been around already a while trying to figure out how he's going to fund his company. But then at the same time, he came... Elon Musk had just did the PayPal exit, had a lot, had the cash that he was able to come and, you know, pay the bills for the first couple of years and kind of build up to where he was able to then get that financing. And as you probably know, Tesla was on the brink of bankruptcy and they were not going to be able to build their manufacturing plant. And then they were able to secure through the loan program office of the DOE, a loan guarantee that helped them build their first manufacturing facility to get cars onto the road. And essentially, the federal government gave them that line that they needed to get to the finish line and succeed, right? That was a perfect example of a public-private partnership that got to the finish line. And they are, and the Biden administration has has been doing a lot of that. And I really hope that it pans out for them because there's a lot of those kind of things. But it kind of like, to your point, conveying it to people, unless they see it themselves, is very hard. And the people who I think like what we're doing the most are ordinary retail investors who like don't have the capability of actually investing, right? They can invest. You cannot take a retail investor check into a startup. It's just, there's SEC regulations. You have, they need to be a qualified investor. They need to have $250,000 at least in annual revenue or X amount in, in, in assets because there's all these kind of people who retail investor, they, they do this to protect the retail investors and then there's been kind of companies that have come out with these kind of crowdfunding platforms that I'm sure the regulator one of these days is going to start cracking down on because they, they're working out of through loopholes. So it's very hard to like, you could share the vision and people will be inspired and want to, and, and say, oh, I, you know how many emails I get a day? Hey, I want to invest with you. Are you on the NASDAQ? I get a ton of calls like that and a ton of emails, but they're not people who actually could invest with me. But then when I am, you know, up late at night doing a like a pitch to a banker, he's like, wow, the path to revenue on this is so long. Like just too early for me. Yeah, I mean, I'm really like, like I'm, I don't want to, I'm afraid to make name drop on the podcast because like I'm like, I don't want to get in trouble. But I had a conversation with a very big venture capital, one of the top five, okay? Very, very well known. One of the, a household name in venture. I don't even know, serendipitously, I was able to get in touch with him, spoke to him, connected with him, and he was all into like what I was doing, and we were doing going back, and then he handed me off to his team, and we did the due diligence, and he's like, look, what you're doing is incredible, and what you're doing is amazing, and I'm so inspired by what you're doing, and I think that what you're doing is great, but I'm not investing in that space right now. I've already made my bets in, in that particular space. So, and I'm now investing in a different space. So all the best of luck to you. Right. And that's it. That's another no. And you just got to keep plugging away. Right. But I believe that every deep tech story, whether it's Tesla, whether it's SpaceX, 
And those are like the two that I could really point to as like big successes, right? Like how many deep tech companies can we point to as big successes? They're not many, right? Like if you would have thought, if you would have told me a decade ago that Tesla was going to be the largest EV manufacturer in the world and that their bat and that their plug-in system was going to become the de facto standard, which it now is, I would have laughed at you because that you would have thought that like Ford and GM would have figured this thing out by now. And when Ford and when GM came out the Volt, I was a big fan. I was like, oh cool, like a plug-in hybrid and it's gonna and they just that's the first version okay they'll figure it out and they'll get it right and they'll it will take off but they couldn't do it and tesla and elon musk is a genius in marketing he was able to make tesla like get this cult following where like you were a cool tech bro if you have a tesla right and that's what it is today and i have friends that are giving up their teslas now unfortunately because then they realized that when they went on their road trip they needed a car that actually needs has that has gas because stopping for an hour to plug your car at a rest stop is not fun. That's why I personally believe the future of vehicles is going to be plug-in hybrids, where you're going to have a battery, but you're also going to have a gas tank, so you're going to be able to drive wherever you want, and no one's going to stop you. And then it will probably end up being hydrogen plug-in hybrids, where it's going to be sustainable fuel, and that's probably the future, unless we figure out a way to electrify the roads. And that's another example of deep tech. But that's going to take a lot of money and a lot of effort. Now you could maybe get it, if you get it up and running in a pilot level, and here's like, I'm going to give away my secrets to your audience, but like this is a clap. Like if someone wants to make a ton, a ton of money, electrify the roads, figure out a way to electrify them, and charge a very, very cheap premium for every kilowatt of electricity that you're charging that person's vehicle and i don't know how you you have to also figure out how you're going to charge it and how do you know which vehicle is getting charged at that time like there's a lot you get what i'm saying there's a lot of things that, are, that have to be worked out but you're going to print money literally print money you'll be printing money the oil and gas guys if they were smart that's what they would go for because once you could if instead of oil selling oil and gas sell the electricity on the road to the cars that they, they get a billet like easy pass, you know, like you get on the highway every kilowatt and that's probably the way to do it. You get on the second that you get onto the electrified highway, it snaps a picture of yours and then it snaps a picture when you leave, figures out how many kilowatts you drove, how many kilometers or how many miles you drove, what's the price, how much we charge you. And that's probably the simplest way to do it. See, we're talking about, I'm thinking of the idea on the spot. Okay. That's how a deep tech entrepreneur thinks, but but that's where, where I think it's interesting because what I bring to the table that most deep tech entrepreneurs do not is that I'm much more of a business oriented deep tech entrepreneur because that I'm also thinking with every single in our entire society there's always Faustian bargains and the Faustian bargain for any innovation is that people who invest in you want to make money if people just gave us money because they wanted to see the world a better place, oh, how happy we would be, right? But but they want money, and that's nothing. there's nothing wrong with that, but that's what drives them to invest. So, like, when you think about it as an entrepreneur, you have to think constantly about, like, how are we going to maximize profits for the investors while at the same time also providing to the market a product that is the cheapest and most affordable way, encouraging the adaptation of that progress, Right. So that's why I say like, okay, so you got to make sure that it's a, take a macro approach where you're selling the electricity, not at a premium, but at the cheapest way possible where you're making one cent per kilowatt in profit, but now everybody's driving on your electrified roads. So you're basically, there's about 375 million vehicles in the country. Every single one is electric. You're literally printing millions and millions and millions of dollars a day, right? Per day. Yep. Per day. And I think that's what people don't think about enough is like economics fundamentally has changed with the development of technology. Suddenly the model is not how do you get a hundred thousand dollars from one person? It's how do I get one dollar from a hundred thousand people? And because we have this global community that's connected with that, you take that in terms of a money mindset, you do that with a 
technology and a systems mindset, and it's simple solutions that are scalable to billions of people, that's how you drive change. And I think that one of the biggest things is like thinking more holistically and not necessarily just in in the short term that I put money in, I want $5 out. It's the ability to think like, okay, well, what's the long tail of this? And I think patience is one of them that people just don't have with it. But two, it's like from a sustainability perspective, it's the circularity of it. Like how can you drive it in a circular fashion? If you're you know, tying in the, the actual road building company with the electricity company, with the government, with the cars, with all these things, everybody benefits. Maybe the person who's driving on that road gets a little bit of a benefit if they, you know, maybe drive a little bit less on that road or a little bit more on that road. What's the benefit for them? And I think that when we use money as only the gauge, it is a gauge and I think it will always be a gauge. But if we use that as the only thing that we're measuring, it's an unsustainable system because people care about more than that. Like when you sit down at the table and you share a meal with someone, you're thinking about the food, you're thinking about the conversation, you're thinking about the opportunity of, hey, we're enjoying this moment together. You're not thinking about how much profit you made on your investment two hours ago, probably not. And so how do we think more, how do we drive value in people's lives? And I think that's, it gets down to that like human psychology side of what do people actually value? And it's humanity, it's family, it's the ability to enjoy nature, it's food, water, and good stories at the end of the day, good experiences that we can share. I mean, it's going back to like what's written on the tombstone. It's not going to be how much money you made because the money goes away when you die. You don't get to take it with you to the grave, make no mistake. And most of the time, Unless you raise those kids right, they're going to end up fighting about over it and they're going to destroy their lives because of it, you know? But yes, your point on that sustainability, right? Like how we do that, like we need to have, like you said, like that patience, right? A lot of folks are like, let's ban fossil fuels. Okay, let's try to do like a meta analysis on what banning fossil fuels will do to this country. It will wreck our economy. Every you won't be able to get food on the table because there aren't enough trucks to transport it that don't run on fossil fuels. And those trucks, those eighteen wheelers that you see on the highway, those are transporting the bread and the eggs and the vegetables and all the things that you like to eat. Sure. And the so, tires that they're driving on. Exactly. Exactly. Everything. So now you're like, okay, wait, and then and then what about the fact that okay, we're gonna ban fossil fuels so now? You're not going to be able to heat your home during the winter. So like if you live in Alaska, you're toast, buddy. Like you got to go learn from the Eskimos how to survive in like the Alaskan tundra. Like there's a lot of things that like we're just, it's not going to work. So like that's why like when people say, let's go electric. Okay. Where are we getting that lithium? Do you know where we're getting that lithium from? Because I don't. And I'm a guy that we're in the critical mineral space. I can tell you that we don't have enough lithium to supply that transition. So why don't we figure out a way to make smaller batteries and better battery technology so that way we could, you know, get farther with the charge and focus on building out a hybrid economy so that way at least people could continue to drive those cars with, you know, and we could build more of them. So like, because that a regular, you know, like the, the Jeep Grand Cherokee in my driveway, that vehicle is a hard, and if I would have known, it has its EPA estimate was 25 miles per gallon, right? But really, I'm get so I was like, oh, it's not so bad. That car is getting about 12 miles per gallon. And I can't wait till the lease is over because I'm going to replace it with something better. It's it's almost up. I'm looking now at a Honda hybrid or Honda Accord hybrid or the Pilot hybrid. I'm looking also at the, the Toyota Crown hybrid that are like good hybrids, good vehicles, you know that are getting, and I have a friend who now has a Honda Accord hybrid and he's getting the new one. He's getting 45 miles per gallon. That's really good. That means that he's hitting, and that's not a plug-in hybrid, right? That's a regular hybrid. So he's, that's a big difference. 25 miles, wait, wait, 12 miles to 45 miles. You're making actually a difference. Now, everybody was driving that kind of car making a much bigger difference, right? So instead of saying, okay, why don't we go and build a Hummer, 
electrical vehicle that now needs a one, like literally, I think it's like a hundred, a thousand, like a metric ton battery. Not to mention the supply chain of mining that material, yeah, sending that material, it. shipping that material, processing that material, building the vehicle, then delivering it. Do a full life cycle analysis on it with a full LCOA and like a carbon emission, full, like a, a real carbon emission analysis. And you'll start realizing that this car is producing more carbon in its production than a regular, like, than the Jeep Grand Cherokee in the driveway is going to be producing its entire life cycle. Because that car, it's a Grand Cherokee. Come on. It's not like a 1999, you know, Volvo that will go to 200,000 miles. This car is going to maybe make it to 100,000 or before it gets junked, you know, and, and I'm going to drive it for 35,000 miles. If not even, I don't even think I have 20,000 on it yet. So like they're making money on me plenty, right? The key is, is like, so what are we trying to do now? Obviously GM promoting this Hummer as like the greatest thing since sliced bread and Ford pushing their F-150 lightning. Why? Now, okay, you want to go and you want to get a Corvette and you want to get an electric Corvette, that's fine because there's always going to be a market for people who want to buy a sports car and those cars are not really driven a lot, you know, so they're... No. they're if big. anybody's ever driven a sports car, it's not entirely comfortable. Yeah, you're no, not going to uh, go on a road trip in one of them. You're not going on a road trip in your Corvette. You're taking it out to go to the Central Avenue in your town to show off to, all, to, show off to everybody that you got your brand new Corvette. And then you're going home, okay? You're going to go boom, boom a couple times. So that way, like, your buddy Mike knows that you're driving by the pub to let him know that you got your Corvette, right? So the guy who's buying the F-150 Lightning, he's buying it because he actually wants a pickup truck and he wants to be sustainable, right? Because he needs a pickup truck and he wants a pickup truck that is going to be environmentally friendly. But little does he know that the way to build that truck has nothing to do with environmental friendliness. And frankly, the cobalt was sourced from the Congo with slave labor, right? And lithium is actually being produced in South America from brine pools that are have a huge negative environmental impact and then is being processed in China or some other country also with very low emission standards. So what did he actually gain, Right. So like you said, like it requires patience and that's something that as a culture we just don't have yet, but I think we're going to get there. I think that people are slowly starting to wake up that we want a change that we could believe in and we just haven't found it yet. We're going to get there sooner than later. It's just a matter of education, getting the word out and people doing like what you guys are doing with sustainable goat to educate people and to give people the ability to see that and i think that's why it's like so amazing what you're doing because that media is the most powerful mode of transporting ideas mm -hmm. thank you well and part of what we're trying to accomplish is to paint a holistic picture to not not say oh what somebody's doing is bad or you know even we've talked about this sometimes where it's like i'm not going to blame the plastic industry Plastic was a was actually an incredible invention. It allowed food to get to places better, easier, last longer. It feeds people. It helps people. And, and it was an incredible invention. What we just didn't consider was, well, what's the life cycle of this? And how can we put it back into the system? And how can we be more responsible with how we go about the process of plastic, but also the consumption of it? And it's more of a mindset shift of how do we think more circularly and intentional about what we're doing, that's going to have a way better impact. And also thinking about our own community, you know, if we actually think rather as much of a global community as we have, you feel kind of small in a global community, right? If you're like, well, if they're doing that halfway around the world, well, what can I do to even help them? And the reality is you probably can. <laughs> and that's okay though. What your role in that is and what, where you can help is, well, what about your local community? How can you improve the food systems of your local community? How can you really just be a part of what I think living simply is all about? It's live a little bit more simply and realize that in a very complex world, our simple needs to survive are not as complicated as we think. And that the solutions that we can get for the world are very, very big problems and very, very big walls. But like if we think simply about that system, 
well, maybe there's some quicker solutions. Maybe it's decentralized energy. Maybe it's more local food systems. So food's not traveling 2000 miles to every single grocery store. Like those simple solutions actually will have a bigger impact globally by us thinking a little bit smaller. And that's, I mean, specifically on the energy topic, that's where I really want to dive a little bit deeper with you is that we have an energy problem, regardless of EVs and delivery of fossil fuels and energy. If you're charging your car at home, most likely you're charging it using fossil fuels because that is tied into the power grid. And where does that come from? And by the time that power actually gets to your home, it's a lot of it's depleted by the time it gets there too. Where do you see energy going? Because energy to me, it allows the ability for food to be grown more efficiently. It allows more energy for food. Energy allows for more heating solutions. How do you solve the energy problem in a sustainable way? Because you mentioned nuclear and nuclear, I think has a massive stigma. You can take Oppenheimer as, you know, a movie of discussion of saying like, oh, nuclear powers, it's explosions, it's bad, it's melting, it's this and that. But is it that? So I'm going to unpack your kind of comment in three steps. So like media has a huge impact on everything that we do, including on energy. So Michael Moore got canceled because he came out with a film called Planet of the Humans. Have you ever watched it? I have not watched it. Okay, so Planet of the Humans was a fantastic film where basically Moore allegedly alleges that the green movement is actually not interested in solutions. And it's a like really paid for by the oil industry. And he was making a lot of those connections. And there was basically in 2020, there was a whole bunch of climate experts who were claiming that the film was dangerous, misleading and destructive and should be removed from public viewing. And he got basically got canceled, essentially. Right. Why? Because that he was going against the narrative. Now, what his conclusion in the film was, is that we literally should just go back to the Stone Age, which is where I disagree with his premise of the film. He's like, we know we really need to do something drastic. We should just stop consumerism, stop all the things that we need that our daily lives and go back to listen. You know, you could start first, Michael. But that said, there's a point here about how what is being chosen as the form of energy that actually is most sustainable has nothing to actually do with the environment. It has to do with interests of corporations to make sure that they're able to check off certain boxes while at the same time also tap into subsidies and all types of things that they've been able to convince politicians to actually produce. Now, nuclear energy held the most promise for deep, for base load power in human history. Without even a doubt. I recommend that you go on YouTube and watch our yeah, friend the Adam. Terrifying. Which was a Disney produced pro nuclear film. It was actually by Disney. It's called Our Friend the Atom, and it's fascinating to watch like what they were envisioning for the future with nuclear. And there were issues, no no doubt about it. Chernobyl was not a fun experience for anybody, and that was a bad design that the Russians knew was a bad design and they made mistakes they could have avoided and they were more embarrassed of letting the world know that they failed in a nuclear design and therefore that led to more of a bigger catastrophe than actually had to happen. Meanwhile, in the U.S., at the time, a form of media, a film called The China Syndrome, which was with Jane Fonda, who was a huge anti-nuclear advocate, came out with a film where basically there was this theory that if the core melts down in the reactor it basically will melt down through the earth and come out on the other side in China, which has been scientifically proven since to be a complete and utter farce. But very co- interestingly, coincidentally, China syndrome came out at like the same exact time that the three mile Island incident happened. So everybody had watched this movie about a core melting down. So therefore nuclear literally got canceled. Okay. And we were on the road to building over 400 something reactors and all of those projects got canceled. So we were on the road to basically being a carbon free, neutral, like even net negative carbon emitting country. If we would have had 400 reactors, we would be, we would have had electric vehicles a long time ago. The whole grid would have been electric. Like we would have been in a electricity would have been cheap. And by the way, president Carter was supporting nuclear because 
he was actually seeing that as a solution to the oil embargo issues that he had faced during his presidency. So he was supportive of nuclear as a Democrat president. People don't know this, but the problem was that Three Mile Island happened and then the NRC had to deal with the fallout and everything like that. Now, the funny thing is, is that while Three Mile Island happened, it was the greatest missed PR moment in history for any industry. Because the worst that could have happened at Three Mile Island happened, and no one got hurt. And there's a mini series on Netflix called Three Mile Island that talks about it, and it gives kind of an even-handed perspective where it brings the advocates and it brings the non-advocates. And that's like how you really need to do a good documentary where you bring a varying, mm -hmm. like both sides of the aisle, so that way the, the the viewer could come to their own educated decision and have that free will to decide what do they think, right? And that's how I like to live, like I like to hear both sides of the perspective, and then I decide and make my own decision. But instead, nuclear kind of buckled. But the thing is, is that every single technological capability that we have today has already been proven in the world in some sort of way or another. And in fact, the leader of energy production in the world from a technological perspective is China. They're super, super focused on this. And they've made energy as a core component of their Belt and Road Initiative, where they're basically going to build up their Chinese influence throughout all of Asia and Europe and Africa, which from their perspective, they once were one of the most influential bodies in, the, in that whole, you know, Asian Pacific region, because they were a very powerful country for two millennia, right? Already back to the Ming Dynasty, etc. So like when the Western world came and kind of like, you know, exploited the Asian countries for their own purposes. Mostly it was the British Empire. The Americans played their fair share too. China basically felt like it was exploited and it needs to bring back those days of glory. And the way that they're going to do that is through the Belt and Road Initiative, like there was the Silk Road where it was a major source of unique goods. They're going to do the same thing. But what they're going to do is they're going to export energy. And by exporting energy, they're going to control the world, or at least their world. Now, what's interesting is, is that the Chinese are also doing things sustainably. The two spaces that they're investing the most, they're building a ton of coal plants. That's true. You could look at the data. But they've invested the most money in nuclear because that they believe that nuclear is going to be the energy of the future that offers base load power, process heat, desalination, all the various things that are core tenants of a society that can be provided as we have water scarcity is an issue. Desal is going to be a natural way we're going to go. We need it. We need to get that. We need to, we need to start de doing desal so that way we can make sure that the environment is clean. So our rain can start, you know, filling up the Colorado river and other special reservoirs that are very important for the ecological, like kind of continuation of the ecological normalcy in these, in these uh, states and in these regions that, without sources of water, all the life, the wildlife will die, right? So we need to kind of, and these are very important parts of our ecosystem and what we, how we live, and the planet will fall apart if there's no more animals in the world and there's no more fish. In fact, like here, it's like going really far into the future. If I had to paint it for you, I believe that in 20 years from now, nuclear will be 50% of the energy in the, in the world, at least. I believe that there will be probably a colony on the moon maybe even on Mars, and we will look, coal will be a manufacturing material, and we will figure out ways to leverage artificial intelligence and robotics to basically, you know, accelerate our lives and to be very efficient in what we do to the point that we're going to start working on moving away from this planet, and basically it will become like a reservation where the most wealthiest people in the human in, in the human race will be allowed will be able to afford to live like we eventually will in a hundred years from now i don't think that all humanity will be here anymore i think we'll be gone like earth will be that planet that we left behind for sure in 500 years from now earth will be a planet that humanity is like oh that's like where we come from it's a place of pilgrimage where people go to visit, you know, like the way you go to Disney World, you're going to go to Earth to visit the War Earth. It's going to be like, you know, they'll maybe they'll even like do some genetic. I don't think they'll ever build a Jurassic Park, but 
maybe they will. You never know. But who knows? But the point is, is that with nuclear energy having that base load power, that's the only way we're going to be able to transition away from fossil fuels. And the key is, is that if we're going to do it, we need to do it in a sustainable, holistic, and vertically integrated way where it's not just about the energy, it's about what else can a nuclear reactor offer to society. And that's where we need to develop nuclear energy. That's where we need to go. And I think that a lot of people are not there yet. They're just thinking of, okay, nuclear energy, a way to help, you know, lower carbon emissions. But there's so much more that it could offer us, whether it's the isotopes, whether it's like, okay, let's just go down a rabbit hole for a second, right? So, like, if you're able to build a thorium reactor, right, now that's going to provide you, it's a molten salt reactor, so it has high process heat, so it's going to be able to produce energy. Heat, also going to be able to use that process heat to be able to do desal. desal. So you're basically, you build those on the shore bringing in water, desalinating while you're producing energy. And then the material, uranium-233, which you have to figure out the safeguards because it technically is a fissile material that could be turned into a nuclear weapon. That is a Faustian bargain for sure, that all Mm -hmm. nuclear can be weaponized. And that's like what you said with Oppenheimer, right? That like there's that Faustian bargain. You either have a nuclear reactor for peaceful purposes, that same exact material that's in that reactor with the right chemistry can be turned into a nuclear bomb and kill a lot of people. And that's a risk that we're going to have to be willing to take. Just like, you know, we've used fossil fuels for many years. And the Faustian bargain was that once in a while you have an oil spill that kills a lot of vegetation and wildlife and ocean life and is a big mess that needs to be cleaned up. But at the end of the day, those are part of the equation. You have to mitigate. At the end of the day, no one stopped driving cars after that happened. Everybody's upset about it because we're all feeling very uncomfortable that the gas that we're pumping into our car just killed like thousands of, of animals. And it's really sad to see those seagulls black and dripped in oil, right? And it's something that breaks your heart. But you didn't stop driving your car because of it, you know? And the reason yeah. is, is because at the end of the day, we are a species that's first and foremost about survival, right? Yeah. And we're going to do what we need to do to survive. And that's what we evolved from. We literally lived. There were much scarier animals when the Homo sapiens came into their into being, right? <laughs> You know, they don't even exist anymore, right? Every time I go to the museum and I see the teeth on that that Smilodon, I'm like, holy cow, like my great great ancestor was running away from that thing. <laughs> terrified and running for its life. But it's figured out a way to like, you know, dig a ditch and put some spikes and trick that Smilodon to chase him and fall into that ditch and die. So now now the smile Don is out of the picture. So now he and his buddies are going to go take down that massive mammoth elephant, right? So that way they're going to go and they're going to have dinner to feed their family for the next six months during the ice, the, the, the cold part of the winter, right? This is what we do. So like we have to be willing to make those Faustian bargains, so to speak. And I like using that word a lot because it really is a Faustian bargain because frankly, there always will be bad people. It's just, it's a sad part of our reality. There's always going to be people. And I mean, like, look, we all aspire that we can, you know, elevate our society to a place where everybody is living in harmony and everyone is not jealous of each other and everybody is happy with what they have and no one feels like they have less than the other. And, and, you know, and you start thinking about it, you're like, I remember when I was a kid, I was talking a lot to my dad about socialism and I was telling my dad how like the basic tenets of socialism sound so amazing. And my dad like gave me a little dose of reality. He's like, yeah, every time that it was tried, there ended up being a cast of those who haves and those who don't. He's like, so on a practical level, it sounds amazing, a free and equal society. He's like, but human nature is not capable of doing socialism right. Get what I'm saying? (laughs) Oh, yeah, 100%. Well, and I think that that's one of those things of, of balance is that we won't reach a net zero world. It's that same concept. It's like, we're not perfect. So nothing we create is going to be perfect. And there's an opportunity cost that accompanies any type of decision that we do make. And what's the one that has basically the most benefit for animals, plants, humans, the whole entire system with the least amount of cost. And 
you know, the willingness to be able to try something different, even nuclear fission versus fusion. Like you even look at just inside the nuclear space, there's exploration in different ways to do that. It's this idea of how do we increase that benefit? And I think that when you have thorium or other energy that can actually be provided, you increase those benefits. I mean, water access and food access is going to be huge. So let's just jump back to thorium for a second. So on thorium, right? Thorium is as common as lead, right? Wow. So literally, uranium is not as common as lead. Uranium, we have a supply issue. But imagine if you could power a thorium reactor by putting gravel in the parking lot into your reactor. That's what a thorium reactor is. And that's the promise. So like while you will be able to have a much larger fuel economy, you'll have a much more efficient fuel you do have that uranium-233 fissile material that's being produced. So you have that proliferation potential hazard, right? But at the same time, that proliferation hazard, the uranium-233, also a byproduct of it is actinium-225, which is a medical isotope that in targeted alpha therapy can literally eradicate cancer from the face of this planet. And I don't know, I don't know if I have the ability to share with your audience, but your audience can look up targeted alpha therapy actinium-225, and they can look at the images of the folks who have been tested on them, who these te- they've done tests on them, where they've had stage four, mast- can- stage four cancer mastocized to their bone, and after a treatment or two or of actinium-225, they were cured of cancer. So now if you asked me, I'd be like, well, let's make a thousand thorium reactors so we could cont- constantly produce amongst all the other benefits, as much actinium-225 as we want. So basically, we will literally eradicate cancer from humanity because now we can literally inject a, a shot of actinium-225 with a ta- targeted alpha particle, like with an antibody into a person, and now you literally just cured them of their cancer at the price of a flu shot. Now, these are things that we can't even imagine, right? But that's deep tech, right? That's what that there's, it's going to take time to get there. So now let's see how long it's going to take to get there. We're going to need to build a thorium reactor. So we're going to first need to to make some uranium-233, which we don't have really much anymore in the world, at least a clean supply. So we need to build a plutonium-based reactor, which we could potentially do in a non-proliferation way with a transuranic blend fuel. Now we're going to use that. We're going to introduce it. We have to make it a fast reactor. So that's already 15 years away with regulations, et cetera. Now that reactor is going to now produce fuel. So let's say five years of, of introducing uranium to thorium into that reactor. It's going to actually go through the fission process and it's going to create uranium 233, which is a material that's not exist in nature. So we have to make it right. And then once you have enough material while you're doing that, you'll start designing and developing your thorium reactor. So only in 30 years from now, do I see realistically a thorium reactor coming into market and producing actinium-225 to cure cancer. Now, it's funny because you mentioned fusion, right? I don't understand why anybody invested money in fusion because the fusion itself has needs fission in order to get to fusion because one of the key ingredients of fi- fusion is tritium. And tritium is a byproduct of a fi- of fission. So there's no economical way to make fis- like tritium without a whole fleet of nuclear reactors that are producing tritium to be able to support a fusion reactor. In fact, there was one game that I played once that like the whole goal of the game was to build a fusion reactor on the moon. Forgot what it was called, but it was like one of these fun games. I think it's called, let me check. I have to, let me just remember what was it called? What was it called? I think it was called Anno 27. 2070, like ANNO 2070, and the whole entire game was to build a fusion reactor. And I actually really enjoyed the game because it actually had resource like collection was a very big part of the game. And they actually got it right that you need a lot of tritium to get to this. So like the way that you mine tritium is on the moon because the moon has tritium. So the fusion guys, I I guess they want to mine tritium from the moon, we might as well just build reactors here and create, create tritium, right? Why go and find the moon? But that was in the game. They didn't do that. They didn't say, okay, build a thousand fission reactors and then build your fusion reactor. Like, we'll build a fusion reactor on the moon and have a space elevator from Earth to the moon 
and build a fusion reactor on the moon, which again, possible, but it's also a lot of, that's a big project. Like that's talking about to make a space elevator, talking about hundreds, if not thousands of billions, right? Who knows? So let's say the fusion, they will raise about three and a half billion dollars in fusion. Fusion is not going to happen on a commercial scale. I'm going to take a risk here and publicly say at least for 30 years. Yeah. Well, and if you're looking at solutions that are 30 years out, right? Why do it? The world might not even exist in 30 years, some might say. Some might say, oh, well, you know, what's the point? Why should humanity, people, pursue something that's even 30 years in advance that may or may not work? Like, why? Yeah, I think the reason why we do it is because that at least the people... So I don't know why the people who invested the money are doing it, because that they know how long this is going to take, so they obviously invested money in that. But why are you doing it? Why are you pursuing something that could take right, 15 exactly. years, I, I, I 20 years, why, 25 years? I don't know years. why they're doing it, but I know why I'm doing it. I'm doing it because that I believe I'm an optimist, and I believe that the world will be around in 30 years from now, and I believe that it's not going to take 30 years to hit a couple of the milestones that are going to also be able to generate revenue, but also be able to make the world a better place. And I think that it's worth it if it takes me 10 to 15 years of my life that I dedicate to make the world a better place for my children and for my grandchildren and for your children and for your grandchildren, that one day they'll look back and they'll say, yeah, you know, in 2023, there was this rabbi who decided that he was going to go and figure out a way to recycle nuclear waste and, and then build reactors that consume that waste. And then that helped create, pave the way, you know, for thorium reactors. And then they ended up figuring out a way when he was 30 years into his company, he figured out a way to cure cancer in a sustainable way. And, and then, you know, there was a whole bunch of fusion companies and he was able to to supply them with tritium. You know, you have to have like three things, like there's the rule of three, right? So like I have my three things in each company, like each product, each company has three products in the nuclear. I'm focused on the nuclear waste and on basically on uh, producing a reactor that can consume the waste once it's processed because we upgrade the waste. Right. So, yeah, that will be an old man in a wheelchair, you know, and people will come over to me and tell me, you know, the world is a better place because you did your part right? It will be worth it because that we left them with something better. And I think that all the people who, from time immemorial, the folks who went and got onto the the Mayflower, right? To settle the new world, they didn't do it because some maybe did do it for the wealth, but many of them did it because they were the Puritans. They wanted to move to, the, to this new world and build a new life for themselves because they felt like they had a better shot and they went through a really hard time to build a country today, 250 years later, that is literally like the most successful with all its problems, with all its cultural strife, with all of the divisions that exist that we need to work out and figure out a way to solve. We still are the most successful democracy in the history of the world, without even a question, and what we've been able to accomplish in such a short time. And if you go to those folks who settle, those original settlers, and say to them, hey, do you know what you did, like what you behaved? They came back today. They, I promise you, they literally sat down on the floor and they would just start crying, you know, in that like overwhelming feeling, you know, there's this great movie. I'm like, and that's why, by the way, I love what, like, I love film as a media medium of expression. And that's like when like a, a real good actor does a role really well and captures that soul of like that struggle and like the music swells up and you kind of like connect to the character and there and that's like what cinema is at its best so it's this movie with bradley cooper called burnt have you ever seen it Mm -hmm. i have one of my favorite movies because it really captures the struggle now here's an entrepreneur he's just trying to make a restaurant you know and he wants to get that michelin star and there's a lot of challenges and there's a lot of drama and it's like, I'm a little bit of a foodie cause I like food. So there's also that component. In it. But in the end of the film and yeah, spoiler warning for the audience. Okay. He gets his Michelin star. Right. And there's this scene where Bradley Cooper's standing there 
on like this like this porch outside and he's just like looking out into the horizon and his maitre d comes over to him and tells him that it was published you know and he got that star and that like that moment in cinema that captures that moment of victory of like accomplishing what you what everybody told you was impossible is the most satisfying feeling that a human being can ever have and we obviously do like microdose on these kind of things like on a regular basis like we have certain things that we want to accomplish and we accomplish and we feel great but the saddest part about humanity and it's our greatest strength is that we will never be satisfied so you have to embrace that if once you figure out a way to embrace that and use it to completely drive you till the grave you will achieve the impossible because you can never be set. You have to like tap into that, right? It's never enough, you know? And I think there's not a lot of people who think like that, you know, like, because of this, I don't know, like, I just want to like, you know, most people just want to cruise, but our ancestors, that's what drove them to make, to build the wheel. That's what drove them to, you know, get out of a cave and build a hut. And that's what drove them to eventually figure out a way to build tools and to build a bow and arrow and figure out how to make steel and figure out how to build armor and build, figure out ways to tame animals to work for us and figure out ways to, you know, domesticate animals so we don't have to, like, lose half the tribe to take out an animal, you know? Like, there was, like, it was not enough. Like, we were never complacent and we never will be complacent. I think that that is something that, we have to tap into much more. Well, and I think there's such power in the moment of, of that chasing after something and putting in true work, struggle, challenges, overcoming them, feeling like it's not going to happen, getting a glimmer of hope, continuing to persevere. There's a satisfaction in that process. And I think one of the more beautiful moments about that is when you reach that moment, does it feel the same as when you set out to do it? And most likely not because the process of doing it is actually the development. It's not the moment of accomplishment. It's the wrapping up of, I put in all that work over that time. It wasn't, if you were to fast forward all of a sudden and you experience that moment, it wouldn't feel the same. Yeah. And I promise you that Bradley Cooper's character in that film was not going to be satisfied with one Michelin star. He now wants three, you know? Right. And when I got my first rabbinic ordination, I literally thought that I was going to have that Bradley Cooper moment and I actually didn't. And it was one of the most depressing moments of my life because I really thought that I was going to reach that like pinnacle of my life where I was going to have that moment where I was just going to be like, Oh my gosh, I made it, you know, I did it. Yeah, I did it. And I didn't have that feeling. And then that was when I realized that I'm never going to be satisfied and I need to embrace Race, that lack of satisfaction as a driver to always make myself better. And it, it was a process. It didn't happen overnight. I'm not like some saint that I was like, okay, right. here we figured it out. You know, like, <laughs> yeah. it's, totally. It's an ever going process. But I mean, you're right. When you hit that moment, you're like, okay, cool. But what's next? And it's the joy in it. I think the joy in it is the curiosity and the discovery and pushing the boundary of what's possible whether that's for yourself, whether that's for the world, whether that's from science, whether that's technology, whatever a person decides to pursue, whatever your goal is, it doesn't have to be the big thing that everybody wants fame for, because most likely you won't be famous for the thing that actually has the biggest impact anyway. The thing is actually the pursuit of it and a willingness to go to the next thing and take that experience and the hardship that you experience and know that you can take on the next thing. And so what would you say to somebody who is 13, 14, 15, world's an oyster, they can do anything. What would you encourage them to do? Something that they are going to be very passionate about, that they're going to love with every fiber of their being, that gives them satisfaction, that makes them feel like they are actually accomplishing. And that doesn't need to be deep tech. You don't need to be a person who pursues big ideas. You know, If you want to be a restaurateur, or even just you want to have the like a bodega, right? Or you want to just sell some street food. Go for it. Pursue your dream. 
but just realize that it's going to come with struggle and it's going to come with pain and it's going to come with, with a lot of challenges. But if you persevere and you give it your all, more likely than not, you're going to succeed and you will have fulfillment in your life. But I think that there's one element that I think that I didn't touch on that I think definitely needs to be done no matter what you do. You got to be honest, not only with yourself, but with the world. Don't try to cut corners. Don't try to jip people. Be like, as they say, like they used to say, it's in Yiddish, be a mensch, you know, be a human being. Ultimately, what, what we've survived as a species, because of, through the hardest times, we learned to work together and to find common goals, you know? And that's why we have developed system, court systems. That's why we have police. And that's why we have laws. Because as a society, we came to the conclusion that, you know, having these systems is much better than being, you know, a free-for-all in, in the Middle Ages where it's basically each man for himself and it's a man eat man world. That's why they call it the Dark Ages because it was a pretty bad time, right? After the fall of Rome, essentially the whole world fell into chaos for a good couple of years, right? Because that all of the systems of government that existed, and that's the danger of imperialism, is because that if that empire falls, then the downside, obviously, besides for the lack of security, is that there's also chaos that ensues in the wake of that. So, like, if you're going to, like, charge people, like, let's say you're going to go do a, like, you're going to go make your, uh, get a street food truck, and you're going to sell, like, the best, like, sandwich, like, Reuben sandwiches, you because you just love making Reuben sandwiches, and you think you have the best Reuben sandwich on the, on the planet, like, literally, like, put every ounce of love and passion into every one of those Reuben sandwiches and give it your all. And then you're going to have, you're going to see people are going to flock to you. They're going to want to buy your Reuben sandwich from all over the world. They'll come to eat your Reuben sandwich because they're going to be able to feel that passion. It's electric. You know, it's like something that's beyond just the physical, it's metaphysical thing that really, I think binds all of us. And it's something that we could tell when you look at a person and you're walking down the road someone smiles at you, you could tell if that person's about to like steal your wallet or they're a spot because they're a nice person who's just giving you a smile because they're in the zone, you know? Yeah. I mean, I think the humanity of it is the, is the beautiful part and it's realizing that we're human. I mean, my dad has been an airline pilot my entire life. And what's so interesting is I will never forget the day of September 11th. I will never forget that. And I remember it very deeply as a kid whose dad was on a runway and who knew people who were involved in it. And one thing that I think was equally as tragic as beautiful is I think everybody also remembers what September 12th was like. And there was something so beautiful about that day in the sense that it doesn't matter if you were the person making the Reuben sandwich. It doesn't matter if you were high finance. It doesn't matter. Everybody was a human. And there was like this moment of true compassion for one another. But why do we need an event like that to do that? And I think that that's, to me, it's how do we encourage that type of humanity in every day? Yeah, I, I completely agree with you. I think that that's something that it really, I don't know, that you got me there. I think that like, you know, John Lennon, imagine, right? Like that world. But the th problem is, is that as long as kind of kind of circles back to what we're talking about, as long as there is scarcity of food, scarcity of energy and scarcity of materials to s propel us forward, we will always be a society that is at war with each other because that survival of the fittest is king when you don't have abundance. And therefore, if you ask me, what is the role of America? The role of America is to make sure that there's that abundance everywhere, not just here, but in the entire world. And that's, I think, where we fail as a country on a very macro level, because that deep down, we want America to be America and want the rest of the world to be the world. So that once you bring everybody to an equal pedestal, where everybody has the same, then you're just another Joe Schmo, right? If, if you literally are a multi-billionaire and you win and you said, okay, I'm dividing all my money again um, with all my friends in my community and I'm going to have the same as everybody else. Now you're just another, you're no longer, you know, king of the hill. You're just another regular guy, right? 
And that's something that most people who have that type of status, they don't want to give that up. And I think the federal government and the people in power, they obviously don't want to give it up. They like it when members of all the other leaders of the world come and sit in their office and kiss the ring and ask them for American aid, etc. Now, I'm not saying we should do wealth re redistribution. I'm not getting into that. What I'm trying to say is that there are ways to do that, to propel the rest of the world without sacrificing what we want as a country, you know? And there's a balance to find to do that. But I think that, like, one day we will get there. I think that, sadly, and I don't know if that even is, if it's real or not, but if there ever was a threat from an alien species, then humanity would become one society. We would become one. I think that we could work, because that will be like that September 12th type of event, right? If we survive, if there are aliens, A, and B, if we survive the first attack, right? <laughs> <laughs> 100%. Right, which is like watch it. Like you and I both grew up with all these movies, like Independence Day, right? So oh, like yeah. we grew up where like that first attack, you know, if you don't survive, and that's it. uh, <laughs> that's, it's over, right? But yeah, look, these are a lot of cool thoughts. But I think that nuclear energy will for sure. And I don't want to like and other methods of energy, but if doing it, a sustainable circular economy for energy, where various energy systems are used for different type of situations, if it's done in a holistic, vertically integrated way where everything is fit like a peg into a hole or with like, so to speak, preconceived knowledge, a preconceived knowledge base of what needs to be done and it's like put into the right place, that will automatically net the result that you talked about on an energy level. The net result of that will be obviously the ability to feed a lot more people. And once we do that, being able to feed a lot more people will also uplift people because poverty and malnourishment is for sure one of the biggest issues in third world countries where people just don't have enough to eat. And it's not they don't have the resources to do it. They just don't have the funds and the capabilities and the energy to be able to do all of those things they need. So those are things that we have to think about. But I guess it kind of like with my shameless plug, it kind of like ends up being that the only way we get there is you got to take care of your backyard first. And therefore we need to make critical investments in technologies that are going to help us uplift our people. Like there should not be one American on food stamps. It shouldn't be. We shouldn't have to have entitlement programs because that people shouldn't need those programs. They should be able to have a steady income, have a job, have a cable. There, there's plenty of work for everybody. There's plenty of opportunity for everybody. The problem is that we've kind of allowed a lot of those opportunities to escape this country that we've got. And by the way, there's so much opportunity potential that we like where the point is that there's not enough job. There's not enough work workers that you need to bring in immigrants, you know? Mm -hmm. yep. yep. I was once talking to some Republican legislature and it was the funniest thing. He told me deep. He's like, I support like, bringing in a whole brand new slew of immigrants from South America. I was like, oh, really? Publicly, you don't talk that way. He said to me, yeah, well, I'm from, you know, Central Valley, California, and we can't find, you know, like classic white middle-aged Americans to come and collect the pistachios and the almonds in our fields. The only folks who are willing to do it are South American immigrants, right? So my farmers that are all like, you know, rah, 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 Republicans, they all are hiring all these immigrants, right? And that's when you realize that the world is very much human? Yeah, and I was like shocked by that because I was like, whoa, okay. So why can't you say that publicly? Oh, if I said that publicly, I would never win. Career suicide. That. Yeah. And so the one of the questions that we ask every guest on the podcast is, where is your favorite place to enjoy nature? So... There's this place called Comset Park, and it's on the northern shore of Long Island. And you basically walk about two miles. So there's like, like the regular trail with, that's paved that people walk around and run and jog. And you go and you walk at a bunch of mansions. And it's like one of these like, you know, Great Gatsby type of mansion grounds, whatever. It's like on this little island, like it literally has like a little island. 
but if you go off track and there's like a trail for like two miles that you walk all the way to the shore and you suddenly come out of this dense forest and you walk up onto a hill and you see the Long Island Sound through the trees and the view that you have, you don't see any human remnant. Like there's nothing there that like you can't see any mansions. You can't see any people it's like a pebble oriented, like a rock based like shore. Cause the long islands on the North shore is not really so much sand. It's all like fine pebbles. And you literally walk out there and you like, imagine yourself like a native American looking at like a, like a colonial ship just, you know, just docking in that area, right? Like it has that type of like the most peaceful and most serene experience. If you ever come to New York, I recommend, let me see if I could even find a picture because I'm going to show it to you over the camera if it works. But this really was one of the most amazing views I ever had in my life. And I just yearn to go back there on a regular basis because every time I go there, I just feel this like sense of calm. I don't like the beach like when it's full of people. Okay. So like during the winter, because I live in Farakaway, which is in the Rockaway near Rockaway Beach, I go to Beach 59th Street, and there's like a small beach there where there's just like the waves are really big, and a lot of the surfers go there in the early in the morning, and I literally just will go there with my wife and we just go sit there and just watch the waves and watch the surfers, and it's super relaxing. But Comset is a completely different chill because it's like that's in nature. And the last time I was there, I was there with all my kids and we trekked out there and we walked out there and then <laughs> and it started pouring rain. And we're like, okay, well, we're two miles away from the path. There's no way we're going to make it. So we just embraced the rain, you know, and that was amazing here. So check this out. Oh, that's beautiful. I wouldn't even think that's in the U.S. Right. And that's like, you literally... If you imagine like the way I took the picture, because I just saw it, I was like, you are like peeking out of the bushes and you imagine you see a massive ship there with its sails just and the sitting there. just sitting there. You're like, what is that? You know, that's incredible. It's really a special place. And yeah, that's pretty amazing. Well, thank you just for spending the time talking deep tech, talking humanity, talking the way that you know, we can start to see the world a little bit differently and maybe bring back some of that innovation in our, in our lives that was, that have always been there, but maybe we haven't paid attention to it. And, you know, hopefully we'll, we'll see the world getting a, getting a better place in the coming years through the people that are inspired to chase what they see the world can be. God willing. And it really was a pleasure talking to you as well. And thank you for the thoughtful and just, you know, the mind bending questions and always happy to catch another schmooze i think there's a i think we could have done this for another 10 hours but <laughs> <laughs> which we still could <laughs> yeah but it was awesome Perfect. thank you so much for your time thank you for listening to the sustainable goat podcast i'm your host steve Cassinum. with each episode we can further define what it means to create a truly sustainable and resilient future I think the new status is to show that, that you actually care. You want to drive change and you want to be part of a sustainable future. People fight for what they love. Let's really hold tight for a small but significant shift in the way we live, we consume, and we plan our life. Join us at sustainablegoat.com.